you've got small children, you should probably go ahead and put them in another room and make sure they're doing something else, because we're about to talk about sex on this episode of The Apologetics. This is Chris Date, and welcome to The Apologetics, where every other week I discuss a wide variety of theological issues and show how a properly biblical worldview can help defend the historic Christian faith from its critics. Join me as we think through what we believe and why we believe it, and not something else. Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Apologetics. My name is Chris Date, and I am coming to you from the my usual location up here in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Puyallup, Washington, where it is currently 105 degrees outside. Um, you know, the Pacific Northwest is not known for heat, and in fact, the Pacific Northwest is... Um, uh, known across the country now for being poorly prepared for the kind of heat wave that we're facing right now. Um, uh, but thankfully, we are able to keep our home at least cool enough to to tolerate, to survive in. You can hear my personal air conditioner in the next room beside me. Hopefully it doesn't uh, distract too much. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm uh, going to... I'm going to push through the heat and, and uh, give you today's episode, all two or three of you that are watching right now. Um, so before I get into today's episode, I've got a really big announcement. I've already made the announcement on the other show that I do and that I did a week ago. Um, but for anybody that watches this that doesn't watch that other show, this will be news to you, uh, maybe news to you anyway. Today, I just signed contracts for the very first book that I will have published with a large traditional Christian academic publisher. It's something that I've been wanting to do for several years. I have attempted on several occasions occasions but have up until recently been um, turned down at every at every turn but now I signed papers with or contracts with IVP InterVarsity Press I'm going to be co-editing a book with Paul Copan hi hi uh, Jonathan good to have you on the show uh, I'll be co-editing a book with Paul Copan it will be a two views book on hell um, but we think that it's going to bring something a bit unique to the multi-view literature that's out there in Christian academic publishing because most multi-view books out there are uh, yeah, every view in such a book, book is represented by just a single author. Um, and that single author will have narrow specialization as, you know, most scholars do. So take, for example, the most, you know, the second edition of Zondervan's Four Views on Hell. You've got the Doctrine of Eternal Torment represented by Denny Burke. And Denny Burke has certain specializations. Um, it did, Susan. It did come through. And, and I got the contract. Glad, uh, glad to be able to announce that today. Um... Uh, so he, Denny Burke represents the traditional view. He's got his specializations. John Stackhouse represents conditional immortality. He's got his specializations. Robin Perry, universalism, and so forth. But what you don't have uh, in these multi-view kind of books are books where multiple disciplines are represented in dialogue with each other. And the book that Paul Copan and I are going to be co-editing for InterVarsity Press, or IVP, is going to be a multidisciplinary dialogue between six authors who hold to the doctrine of eternal torment and six authors who hold to the doctrine of conditional immortality or annihilationism. There will be one on one author on each of those two sides representing biblical theology, one author from each of those sides representing exegesis, one author from each of those two sides representing historical theology, and then systematic theology, and then philosophy, and then pastoral philosophy, uh, pastor pastoral theology. So six disciplines, one author for each of those six uh, disciplines on each of the two sides of the debate, and they will each be contributing a roughly 6,000 word essay, in a constructive essay, you know, sort of a positive contribution to their side of the debate, and they will respond in roughly 2,000 words to their counterpart on the other side of the debate. So the person who does the biblical theology chapter for um, the doctrine of eternal torment will respond to the chapter that is written by the conditional immortality person doing biblical theology. 
and so on and so forth throughout the discipline. So I think this is a really um, a unique, groundbreaking book, both within the um, literature on the topic of hell and the multi-view genre itself. And IVP appears to uh, to agree that it's somewhat unique and groundbreaking. Um, they were very enthusiastic uh, and, and agreed enthusiastically to take on our project. So I was thrilled to be able to sign the contracts today. Um, I think that this is probably going to be released like in early 2023. Um, and the main reason for that is that whereas the other books that I've published, um, there's not a whole lot of time that transpires between when the manuscript is submitted and when it goes to publication. Uh, the same isn't true with IVP and probably other larger Christian publishers. There's a much longer process um, editorializing and, um, or sorry, editing and marketing and all sorts of other stuff. So it's going to be a bit of a long process, probably 2023. Um, but I think it will be, I think it has the potential to become the second most um, important book moving forward in the topic in, you know, of the intramural Christian debate over the nature of hell. Um, I think Edward Fudge's The Fire That Consumes will remain the premier um, book and the, the most important book on the, to uh, on the topic, but I think that this one may very well become second um, so that anybody that wants to do sort of academic writing on the topic of hell um, will need to consult this book as well. So I'm super excited about it, and as you can imagine, it's also great for the ministry that I work with, Rethinking Hell, and it's great for me personally in terms of my academic career. Um, I'm super excited. Um, and I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, also, let's see here. Um, I think it'll also be uh, really beneficial for the school that I teach at, which, and, and I mentioned that because I, I want to make sure I get back into the habit of saying at the beginning of every episode that uh, the Apologetics is a member of the Trinity Commission. The Trinity Commission is a network of podcasts and YouTube shows that are in some way, shape, or form connected to Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. Uh, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary is the school over which Braxton Hunter is president. He's the host of Trinity Radio, a popular um, Christian Apologetics channel on YouTube. It's also where Jonathan Pritchett, who is the co-host of Trinity Radio, is the vice president for academics. And at that school, I'm an adjunct professor of Bible and theology. If you're somebody that wants to get a higher Christian education, but you don't have the time or the money to be able to do a, a traditional brick and mortar institution, um, check out trinitysem.edu. That's trinitysem which is short for seminary, trinitysem.edu. Um, our prices are very affordable, our programs are flexible, and, um, and, and and I really do firmly believe in what Trinity is doing, and I'm honored to be a part of it. And what's really cool is that by publishing with IVP, I'll be able to um, uh, bring a little bit of attention to Trinity, which I'm really excited about. So, uh, And then as far as the Trinity Commission, if you just search for Trinity Commission on Facebook, you'll find a page, and it will tell you some of the other shows that are a part of the commission. It includes Trinity radio. It includes The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. It includes Soteriology 101 with Leighton Flowers and others. So I hope you'll check those out and I'll stop with the sort of introductory bragging stuff and tell you what's going to happen in today's episode. So I'm coming to you live right now, just like I did at the beginning of uh, the episode two weeks ago. Um, but like the episode that I did two weeks ago, I have a pre-recorded interview that I'm going to play with you here momentarily. And then once the pre-recorded interview is done, I will return to close out the show live, and I'll be monitoring the chat in between, so if there are any discussions that I can contribute to, I'll, I'll try to chime in. Uh, but the interview that you're going to be watching is with my friend Eric Silverman. Um, Eric Silverman is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Christopher Newport University in Virginia. Um, Christopher Newport University is a public, non-affiliated, you know, non-religious affiliated um, university, and Eric is a tenured professor there, if I'm not mistaken. He specializes in contemporary ethics and medieval philosophy, and he regularly teaches courses in ancient 
written medieval philosophy, uh, modern philosophy, critical thinking, logic, philosophy of religion, and the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. He's authored or, or contributed to a number of books, including a book on the, uh, uh, on the relationship between the Game of Thrones series and Christian philosophy. I think it's called The Game of Thrones and Philosophy. Uh, but that's not the book that he's going to be talking about um, in this interview that I'm going to be playing here in a moment. Rather, he recently published a, a, an edited volume all about the virtue of chastity. Um, and you'll hear us in this interview talk about Eric, about his book, about virtue ethics, about the virtue of chastity, and so on and so forth. So as I said, introducing, you know, in the cold open, introducing the show, there will be a little bit of talk about sex in this, and so um, it may not be appropriate for the most sensitive of ears. So if you have young children, in the very, very unlikely event that you have young children that like to watch The Apologetics with you, this might be an episode where it would be worthwhile having them... Um, go elsewhere, some other room or something like that. So without further ado, as I said, I'll uh, start playing the pre-recorded interview. I'll stick around in the chat and I will come back on the other side of the interview. So enjoy. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I have very fond memories of when you and I, a few years ago, went to my favorite restaurant in the whole world, Cracker Barrel, uh, after, I think it was one of the Eastern, um, the Eastern Regional ETS meetings, is that right? Um, That's correct. So anyway, I have fond memories. I consider you a friend, and, and it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, as I like to do very often with my guests, I'd love to begin talking about your faith background or, or testimony, if that's something that you have to share. Um, you know, I, my viewers will know I came to faith relatively late in life as a 20, 21 year old. This was about 20 years ago. Uh, was that the case with you or maybe did, were you raised in a Christian home? Tell us about, about that. Um, well, I like to tell people that I was raised hippie. <laughs> My uh, mother was uh, was a Catholic hippie, and my father was a Jewish hippie. And uh, uh, what uh, they they really had in common, and what uh, the worldview uh, was, was uh, was that that nineteen uh, late nineteen sixties, early nineteen seventies uh, hippie uh, worldview. Hmm. Uh, now, now my mother uh, did uh, meet, come to faith in the seventies. Um, and I, I did get exposed to it through her and really made my own uh, adult decision to uh, to place my personal faith in in Christ in, in college. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was involved in groups like uh, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ there at uh, Rutgers during my undergrad years. Um, so that's that's where, uh, you know, just sort of a, a very brief version of, of my background. Do you mind sharing if, if there was one particular thing that sort of convinced you that the Christian faith was true? Is, is there something, was it an apologetic thing? Was it a supernatural encounter, anything like that? You know, one of the things back uh, in my undergrad years that really convinced me that uh, it was at least a better option than anything else being offered to me is that um, the, the very good professors at Rutgers uh, never gave reasons for for the things that they they pontificated. They were very good at asserting things, uh, but if you asked them two or three questions deep on to, to why should I embrace this view, um, they, they they weren't so good once you got past the the argument from their own authority. Mm. Um, in fact, one of the things I noticed in in, in college is. The, the the Christian community was the only community that on a on a consistent basis there that was uh, expected to give reasons for for their beliefs and I wasn't always impressed with the uh, uh, answers they gave but uh, I liked their attempts at answers better than I liked um, the the, the non-answers I, I I got when I uh, pressed my English professors and uh, political science professors on uh, on deeper worldview issues. Now, maybe if I'd pressed the philosophy professors, maybe they would have done a little bit better. 
Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's best that I, I didn't uh, get the chance at the time. Maybe. Uh, either way, I'm glad you ended up a, a believer. Now, you mentioned your, your undergrad work, which was in politics and history, but your master's and doctorate work, which led to the book we're going to be discussing today, was in philosophy. So at what point and, and, and how did you discover that your interest might not have been so much in politics and history and it is more in philosophy? Well, um, my original plan was to become a lawyer and studying political, political science and history are, are uh, some things that uh, uh, people study uh, on, on route to, to law school sometimes. Um, but I got pretty disillusioned with that idea uh, as I studied what actually happens in our justice system. I, I was uh, too idealistic uh, <laughs> to, to go that route. Um, so um, so I, I didn't uh, pursue law and uh, I only had a couple classes in philosophy um, but uh, actually uh, after several years out of school uh, I had cancer in my mid 20s I had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, back in 1998 uh, diagnosed on my fiance's uh, 24th birthday Oof. Um, yeah that, that was kind of a kick in the teeth mm. um, and uh, I decided after I, I got through to the other side of that, uh, that once it looked like I wasn't going to uh, uh, die from that, I said, well, what should I spend the rest of my life doing? And uh, uh, I had questions I wanted to, to investigate. Mm. So um, philosophy is an excellent uh, discipline for people who want to ask questions and have uh, very high powered resources for, for asking questions, whether it's about ethics, uh, religion, science, um, it's really the the foundational discipline uh, that that discusses sort of talks behind the back of all the other disciplines. Mm. And and what about ethics and uh, specifically and, and in particular virtue ethics because that's going to be a, a big part of the book we're going to be discussing. What so not just philosophy more broadly, but ethics and even more specifically virtue ethics. How did that become something that you were very interested and passionate about? Mm. Well, in uh, in grad school. I had the privilege of learning from uh, a professor, uh, Eleanor Stump, uh, who is the, uh, the the top expert in uh, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas in our country. Um, and, uh, and Aquinas has, uh, uh, at least on my interpretation, a virtue-centered approach to, uh, to ethics. Um, and as I studied him and uh, the ancient Greeks that, that sort of shaped his thoughts uh, in part on this, people like Aristotle especially, uh, that it struck me as a, a very uh, elegant approach to ethics, uh, uh, frankly, much deeper than what I find in the, the modern era. Hmm. Okay. And then uh, one or two more questions before we dig into your book. You are a professor at Christopher Newport University. Um, tell us about how you got involved there, what, what brought you there, and um, you know, tell us what, what Christopher Newport's all about. All right, well, Christopher Newport University is a Virginia State public liberal arts uh, college. Uh, we have about 5,000 students, overwhelmingly uh, nearly all undergrads here on campus. Uh, and we focus on traditional in the classroom, brick and mortar, uh, smaller classroom size uh, education where your professor knows your name, where you're not in a 200 person giant lecture hall uh, where you're not doing everything by Skype or Zoom, um, where uh, where you know it's it's that classic uh, liberal you know liberal arts college education. We've got we have an award-winning uh, undergraduate core curriculum uh, that is very broad. It covers Western traditions, it covers world traditions, covers math, science, foreign languages, um, writing. Uh, so this is really, if you want a broad-based education and not just like a specialized technical degree, uh, this is the kind of place to go. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, I think very well of the school here, so much so that uh, despite the fact that I get no discount whatsoever, my, my own daughter has chosen to come here next year, and I heartily approve. There are few, if any, places in the entire country that I'd rather her go. 
Well, that's a glowing testimony, but that leads me to the last sort of introductory question before we dive into the book, which is for, for viewers that might be looking for a higher education and might be inclined toward Christian universities and seminaries, or explicitly Christian ones anyway, why would you, or what would you say to encourage them to at least consider a non-Christian, you know, more secular public university instead? Um, what would be some of the benefits to that instead of pursuing an explicitly Christian education? Well, here's the thing to look out for. Um, there are Christian schools that I think very highly of. I think very highly of Biola. I think very highly of Baylor. I think very highly of Wheaton. I, I think fairly highly of Grove City College, uh, Hillsdale. Um, but if you aren't going to one of these sort of top tier Christian schools that are very serious as academic places and very serious as uh, uh, as uh, as places that have a Christian identity, uh, a lot of these schools, you're just paying for uh, a secular education with uh, a chapel uh, on Sunday. Hmm. Uh, and and even even Christian places will, you'll, you'll be taught the same secular ideas, but they'll be baptized with a, a, a Christian rationale. So uh, there are plenty of professors at Christian schools, including good ones, that are really just secular Marxists who <laughs> will pull a, a verse or two out of the New Testament out of context and uh, and insert Marxism hmm. um, or, or redefine terms like justice or love to, to suit the, their own uh, secular agenda. So, um, so, I mean, by all means, if you are going to one of those top tier Christian schools that are serious as a Christian school and serious as, a, as an academic place, I wouldn't say anything to discourage that. Um, but, uh, but a lot of those, those Christian schools are uh, pretty trivially Christian, at least <laughs> on the academic uh, program. Mm. Uh, the thing I like about Christopher Newport is this really is a genuinely pluralistic place where you have people who are politically left, politically right, politically center. You have people who are very secular thinkers. I mean, we're all secular thinkers, but you can learn about uh, the Eastern religions, you can learn about Western religions, you can learn about uh, secular philosophy, um, and you can write books like my, like my book, where um, where I can say and say, hey, um, there hasn't been a book about uh, the virtue of chastity in a very long time from a secular perspective. Mm. And, uh, and just as my university uh, is plural, plural, pluralistic and diverse, I pulled together a wide variety of thinkers for a wide variety of perspectives on uh, on the issue. Mm. Well, very good. Let's talk about that book that you were holding up there then, uh, Sexual Ethics in a Secular Age. The subtitle is, Is There Still a Virtue of Chastity? This was published just this just recently. And um, I guess what, I guess to get us started, where, uh, where did you develop, how did you develop an interest in uh, the virtue of chastity specifically? And, and, and whence came your idea to, uh, to uh, put this book together and publish it? Well, um, one a lot of it just comes down to what uh, professors uh, uh, pass on uh, as small talk, <laughs> what we consider small talk. I was at a uh, conference, I believe it was the Society of Christian Philosophers meeting in, uh, in the Pacific Division a few years back, and I was at a table in a Mexican restaurant with two or three other professors, and sort of my small talk question is, or at least was, um, what topic should people be writing about that nobody's writing about? Mm. And uh, and when it was time for me to answer my own question, I thought about it and I said, well, wait a second. I know the history of virtue ethics um, and chastity used to be something that almost all of the, the virtue ethics thinkers believed in, uh, whether they were religious or not. Um, if you want to hear some of the, the harshest critiques of, uh, of promiscuous sexuality, you don't need to go to a religious thinker, you just need to read the ancient Greek Stoics or even the ancient Greek Epicurean hedonists thought very badly of, uh, of the results of, uh, of a sexually um, permissive lifestyle. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of asked myself, well, well, what happened? So, you know, somebody should write a book about what happened. Now then, of course, the immediate obvious response is, well, the, the sexual revolution happened and some new technologies happened. I'm like, okay, 
well, but is there still nothing left to be said about this? Right. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I basically, so basically, the idea is, you know, given the historic um, view of, you know, secular philosophy that there is something called chastity that that's a virtue, um, and given that our culture shifted largely because of the sexual revolution, what's there to be said about chastity? Mm. And um, and and I think most of my uh, contributors said, well, there's still something to be said for, if not full on traditional chastity, something still fairly restrictive. I mean, um, you know, you, you can only read so many statistics about pornography addiction before you say, you know, maybe we have a problem as a culture with this. Right. Um, you can only read so many statistics about divorce and uh, children that are, are essentially fatherless. Uh, before you say, you know, maybe this is a, a, a wider cultural problem. Right. You can only read so many statistics that claim that one out of four women is raped in college, and you say, well, gee, shouldn't we do something about that? Um, and and the, the truth is we've tried to do external things about that, tried to, you know, push down more external rules. But guess what? Immorality isn't checked all that well by <laughs> external rules. It's, you know, internal choices. And if you want people to make different internal choices, you have to talk about virtue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, just as a disclaimer, I don't endorse the sentiment that I'm about to express by quoting the ancient church father Tertullian. But Tertullian was, it did famously ask this rhetorical question or questions. He said, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? Now, the reason I mention this is because I'd like, I'd like you to speak to viewers who might be asking themselves, what is the point in engaging academic philosophers in some or maybe even many cases, liberal, if not outright secular ones, on a topic as important to Christian ethics as sexuality, why why engage that kind of um, uh, th those kinds of academics that, that don't have any sort of uh, connection to the historic Christian faith? Good, good. Well, well, first let, let me give you two kinds of answers. First, let's talk about the history of Christianity. Tertullian, of course, did did ask that question. Uh, although the history of Christianity ever since Tertullian has been to say, yeah, Athens and Jerusalem actually have quite a lot to talk about. <laughs> uh, starting, uh, well, not starting with St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, but uh, it, it took center stage when uh, Augustine in the uh, the fourth century read uh, Plotinus and the Neoplatonists and the Christian Neoplatonists and uh, uh, saw in uh, secular Platonism uh, secular arguments for a wide variety of, of uh, uh, re re religiously significant positions. Uh, and we saw another wave of this with uh, Aquinas bringing Aristotle to the center stage in the, the later medieval era. Um, so, you know, it's uh, Christians have often uh, availed themselves of the, the tools of the, the philosophers, mm. uh, logic and such. Uh, so that's the historic reason. But here's just sort of a practical reason. As a Christian, um, you should want to be able to give an answer that makes sense to your non-Christian friends uh, when you um, give uh, an explanation for why you hold the values that you hold. Yeah. Um, and there are answers one can give. Why should a, a Christian uh, reserve sex for marriage? Well, you could just say because the Bible says so. Uh, but guess what? You're not going to get a lot of traction with your secular friends if that's the entirety of your answer. Yeah. Um, uh, and if uh, the Bible is correct when it talks about sexuality as something that uh, is good, uh, but but only good in uh, certain contexts, um, there should be some discernible secular you know, results that one could point to. Sure. Um, I'll even hazard an attempt at a third uh, answer to my own question, which is that, um, you know, all truth is God's truth. And uh, sometimes I think that the church can be so um, mired in 2000 years of tradition that sometimes it takes the perspective of an outsider to help us to realize where we might have gone astray in certain things. And so maybe that's another reason to consider consulting the larger secular culture, not in any, as any sort of authority, but to give God a chance to speak to his people in a way that perhaps they're not able to hear from within the church. Does that make any sense to you, do you think? 
Well, sure. I, I mean, there, there are surely things that any Christian could learn from the secular culture. I mean, if, if the only thing you can learn is uh, uh, the, the basic dictates of math and logic, <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are things that are worth knowing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, absolutely. All right. Well, um, for listeners that might have some understanding of ethics but may not really understand what is unique about virtue ethics as opposed to, say, deontology or uh, uh, utilitarianism, whatever, uh, what are what, what is virtue ethics and what are some of the traditional uh, virtues included in lists of virtues historically? Well, virtue ethics is an approach to uh, moral questions that focuses on character rather than uh, character very broadly, rather than the right answers to very specific puzzles. Mm. So here's what it looks like to focus on very specific puzzles. If a trolley is out of control <laughs> and about to run over five people on the track and you are in control of the trolley and you could switch it off to a side track, but it will run over one person on the side track. Is it better for you to do nothing and therefore keep your hands clean and not be guilty of any killing and let it run, run over the five people? Or is it better for you to get involved and shunt it off to the sidetrack and uh, be an intentional part of causing that one death while preventing the other five deaths? Mm -hmm. That's sort of a traditional uh, action-oriented uh, approach to, to ethics where it focuses on questions like that. Mm -hmm. Where uh, virtue ethics comes in is virtue ethics says, you know, that's an interesting little puzzle you got there, but that's not really at the heart of what we should be asking ourselves. What we really should be asking ourselves is this, what sort of person should I be? And in general, what are the principles that should lead me and how should I live and what character traits uh, ought to uh, ought to shape and drive me? Mm. Um about 20 years ago, there was a movement where a lot of uh, Christians wore these little bands on their wrist that said WWJD, which stood for what would Jesus do? Um, and that's a fine question. But again, that's a very act oriented question. The, the virtue uh, oriented response would be, we shouldn't just ask what would Jesus do? Instead, if you are a Christian and want to live as a Christian, you should ask, who would Jesus be? Right, WWJB. <laughs> well, right, because yeah. otherwise, um, it's it's kind of like, imagine you're uh, a 15-year-old a trying to learn how to master basketball. And you say, well, let's take this act-oriented approach. Let me get on the basketball courts and ask, what would LeBron James do? Hmm. Well, the answer would be, well, LeBron James would make a shot from 30 feet out or run up to the basket hoop and, you know, do a 360 and slam it, slam dunk it behind his head. But unless you're the kind of person LeBron James is, and if you haven't trained the way that he has, and if you haven't eaten the things that he has, and if you haven't thought about the game the way he has, you're not going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking, what would Jesus do? Um, if trying to become the kind of person that that uh, is is Christ-like in their character is a much more, frankly, in my opinion, it's a deeper way to think about ethics. Right. Um, and I will uh, acknowledge. I think that I, I'm pretty sure I did not come up with that that that, that analogy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that uh, the original version of that was a uh, was something Dallas Willard. Uh, I read in a Dallas Willard book. And, and and what are some of the virtues that are historically included in lists of virtues? And and maybe it's worth mentioning, too, that if I'm not mistaken, virtue ethicists also tend to think of something you might call the opposites of the of the virtues called vices. Right. So can you talk about those lists and, and you know, what what they are? <clears throat> sure. Um, some of the important virtues are things like courage, uh, temperance, uh, justice. Uh, practical wisdom. Um, the more the, the very specific Christian virtues were, of course, faith, hope, and love. Um, uh, chastity was usually thought to be sort of a sub uh, aspect, a, a, a sub virtue of temperance. Uh, temperance is about controlling your appetites in general, uh, including things like desire for food. And chastity was an expression of temperance, specifically uh, where it came to the sexual desires and sexual ap appetites. Uh, some of the relevant vices 
Well, for courage, uh, for for a lot of the traditional uh, virtues, there uh, was the possibility of having either too much of something or too little of something. So with courage, you could either have too much fear and be a coward, or even have too little fear and be reckless. Mm. Now, sometimes people have this idea that the ideal is to have no fear at all. Um, the, the ancients used to thought that guy that has no fear at all is actually rather stupid. <laughs> Dangerous. He have a very short life. <laughs> yeah. Right. Very good. So, same thing with temperance. Uh, you, you know, we, we have a desire for food. We have a natural desire for food. Um, if you have too much desire for food, that's something you need to resist. And if you don't resist it, you become a glutton. And if you become a glutton for too long, that's going to have serious health consequences. I mean, gluttony is still the most deadly of the deadly vices. People, you know, statistically die years early, you know, if they if they put on too much weight as the result of uh, gluttony. Right. Um, but there's also such a thing as not having enough desire for food. That also would be kind of unhealthy. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we even have a word for it, but... Um, but there is such a thing as uh, not having enough desire for food. Well, we may not have a, a ethical word for it, but the words anorexia and bulimia kind of come to mind there. So you might have something there. Okay, well that's well that's good. Now historically and into today, not counting chastity, we'll come back to chastity in a moment. But but historically and into today, have these you know accepting hope, love, and and uh, I think the third one he said was it ch uh, faith. Ex not faith. not counting those, have the other virtues in those lists historically and even to this day been embraced by the wider secular culture and not just by religious communities and if so why what what, what does a secular culture see as the value in these virtues if not religious value good good um so yes um at least among secular virtue ethicists most of these virtues have been thought to to have some sort of uh, you know, ongoing significance. Uh, the idea, going all the way back to Aristotle, is uh, that these virtues, in some way, it's good to be virtuous, mm. whether it has good results. Um, you know, I mean, being self-controlled and temperate long term is kind of a good life strategy in general, um, or whether um, just the internal experience of being virtuous was sort of what it meant to be an optimally functioning human being. Mm. Who wouldn't want to be an optimally functioning human being? Why be virtuous is kind of like asking why be healthy, <laughs> because it's health. You know, it, it's 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 part of it's a, a a deeply desirable part of what it could be to be a a, a optimally function human being. So almost, if you will, almost like a utilitarian form of virtue ethics. It's it's virtuous because it works for you. Right. It, it, it's it's not just it's not deontologically virtuous. It's it's utilitarianly <laughs> uh, good to be virtuous is, is kind of like what it sounds like you're saying. Um, now, historically, I think you would say that that, that uh, chastity has been viewed as uh, one of these virtues, even within the secular culture. But I think that you would argue that that's no longer the case, broadly speaking. If, if that's the case, why? And, and, you know, what is it that changed, do you think? I know you hinted at it earlier, but maybe you could expand upon that. So, yeah. So, so here's something that that's that's been very interesting. Um, back in the, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when the sexual revolution happened, we tore down all the old rules for sexual behavior. And, and guess what? Um, did it usher, it, it didn't usher in a new era of sexual utopia. Mm. Uh, divorce rates were up. Uh, chlamydia is, is all over the place. STIs are spread. We, uh, saw that HIV AIDS crisis. I, I grew up uh, that during that and you know some of these things were, were just horrible um and then we look around and say well gee um we we see these bad consequences happening uh and nobody seems to be willing to point to a source what's the cause of things as broad as uh sexual addiction uh propensities towards sexual harassment widespread uh divorce and uh, relational failure um it doesn't take a genius to say well maybe <laughs> we need some sort of 
values pertaining sexuality and and i've left it open maybe we don't need the exact same ones mm. that uh that were torn down in the 60s but to just tear them all down and put nothing in their place um you know that didn't work out so well for us as a culture right um, and i and i think there's i think most people will acknowledge that now what the, what what are people willing to advocate in its place um, that's where people get uh, really gun shy really quick because uh, you know nobody wants to be the the, the guy suggesting sexual rules. <laughs> um, but uh, but if you look at the data, I mean, there's not all there's not much doubt that there's been some negative consequences from this. At the, at the very least, we got to get people to rein rein in the, their their uh, sexual expressions in the workplace mm -hmm. um, so that people can stop being sexually harassed. At the very least, we've got to try to take seriously uh, uh, that things like chlamydia are uh, are still problems in our culture, and and you know thank thank goodness for uh, penicillin and treatments for uh, you know HIV and uh, for other uh, other diseases that used to be uh, you know almost as serious, um, but. Uh, you know, at a certain point, you can't just rely on technology to solve your problems. Right. You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, what what exercise machine is going to uh, keep me in shape? Well, guess what? Um, exercise machines don't keep you in shape. You keep you in shape. That's right. And, uh, and if an exercise machine helps, it's because you made a series of decisions that helped that exercise machine help you. Right. Uh, so another analogy you could you could say what what's the best Bible translation probably the one that you'll read right <laughs> so, yes yeah uh, there you go <laughs> yeah very good um, I want to uh, here in a moment take viewers through a brief tour of your book we'll cover a few chapters but one last question that occurred to me I meant to ask you a few questions ago has to do with just what we mean when we talk about chastity because there there are going to be those of us who have very little we associate very little with the word chastity of, apart from outright abstinence so for example um, I'm a big fan of a movie called uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights and uh, the, the Maid Marian in that movie has a chastity belt on throughout the whole movie and of course a chastity belt is meant to prevent sex so there are going to be a lot of people who think that by chastity we just mean abstinence but i don't think that that would be how chastity is more historically defined so so how would you historically anyway characterize the virtue of chastity for for viewers right right i mean uh historically um chastity involved uh you, you know abstinence before marriage and then um you know sex uh with, within marriage um, the way I used it was just sort of any of the traditional, uh, more restrictive uh, views of, of sexuality. Uh, and, and one of the questions I asked uh, at my conference and for people that uh, contributed to my book is, you know, is there some sort of revised version of chastity <laughs> that might be more relevant to, uh, to today's age? Or at least are there some uh, components that we should uh, consider uh, revisiting? Um, so, uh, so I mean, chastity is just uh, a word about uh, what is sort of the the the, the right uh, range of attitudes towards sexuality. I see. Uh, but but historically, it meant uh, no sex outside of marriage, uh, but uh, but sex within marriage. So maybe a real simple way to put it would be healthy and appropriate sex in appropriate contexts. Something, Something like, that, like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. So let's let's give viewers a little taste of what's in your book in the hope that it will sort of whet their appetite and tease them into getting their hands on a copy. And I want to begin with part one of your book, um, where you and three other contributors that that book on the screen. Although you were only on half of my screen, you want to hold it up one more time, and I'll give you full screen sure. so you can hold it up. Uh, yes. Yeah, so there it is. Sexual ethics in a secular age. So, um, so in the first part of your book, you and these three other contributors offer general visions of chastity, what chastity might look like in today's secular culture. And I want to talk first about you, Alexander Pruss, and Michael Beatty, because the three of you do appear to offer um, visions of the virtue of chastity that even today's secular culture should be able to embrace. So what are some of the, some, what are some of the different things that you and those other two authors I mentioned bring to the table in terms of why a secular culture today might want to embrace a healthy vision of, ch of uh, chastity? Sure. Well, um, Professor Beatty uh, talked about 
uh, an ancient Greek concept of eudaimonia, which just refers to the good life. What's the good life that, that people want? And he says one uh, account that's been popular in America is that a central part of the good life has been to uh, to to have a family, mm. to have a, a close, intimate, uh, healthy uh, relationship with uh, with your spouse, and to have children from that relationship. And he talked about the importance of uh, an appropriate attitude towards sexuality uh, in building that. Um, so here, l- l- let me give sort of a counterpoint. Um, I watch a lot of TV. Me well, too. More so, than, more so than, than a respectable scholar or Christian, probably. Same. Too. Very much the um, same here. So I watched every episode of How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> yeah, all um, right. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me while watching this this show about, you know, this sort of idealized romance between the father recounting how he meets uh, the, this children's mother is, uh, is, is the main character in that show. Um, he had an awful lot of romantic relationships and an awful lot of people that he was sexually involved with uh, but before he meets the mother through, I don't know, seven or eight uh, seasons of episodes. And it occurred to me that, you know what, if you want that, that ideal family and, and long-term romance, um, the, you probably don't get it by living the way that this main character lived. Right. Um, so, so instead, Mike Beatty uh, talks about um, having a, a chaste disposition both before you're married um, and then after you're married and, and as part of your full commitment towards your spouse. Mm. Um, and he offers this as what's called a hypothetical imperative. Uh, he says, well, look, I'm not going to give you a moralistic reason for this. I'm going to give you a practical reason for wanting this. Do you want this vision of the good life? And if you do, then a chaste disposition where you, um, you know, try to wait to, 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 to try to wait sexually uh, for marriage and then commit yourself wholeheartedly within that marriage without, um, you know, trying to uh, look elsewhere and, and sort of cheat. It's thoroughly a secular argument, but it's a very, very conservative viewpoint, uh, uh, frankly, probably more conservative than, than even most of our listeners today, most of our, our viewers. Um, he said, uh, using Immanuel Kant as his basis, uh, he talks about certain uh, topics and matters uh, being sacred, mm. even in a secular sense, that they're of utmost importance. That uh, uh, and, and if you're going to act within them, you need sort of an, a clear, overwhelming justification. Uh, one of those things, one of those matters would be matters of life and death. You don't take a human life without a clear, compelling reason. And the default answer, without that clear, compelling reason uh, to the question, can I kill this human being? The default answer is no. Right. Um, now, you know, I, again, there might be some justifications, uh, killing in self-defense, killing as part of a, a just war. Uh, maybe capital punishment, maybe to protect somebody somebody else who's innocent. So maybe there are some, you know, very narrow range of special circumstances that allow for that. But because human life is sacred, you don't destroy human life without an overwhelming uh, justification. He argues that sexuality is, is similarly uh, a, a special area of morality that, um, you know, it's, it, matters a lot and to become sexually involved with someone is a a very serious moral matter Uh, and he says that uh, uh, therefore any sexual activity needs to meet a very high bar of justification and he argued that in uh, sort of uh, sexual relationships and sexual activities that uh, are sort of geared towards reproduction in some sort of broad sense uh, not that he means every sexual act you need to be trying to get pregnant or get, <laughs> get someone pregnant, but that this is a serious, committed relationship in which you would be prepared to, to raise children and doing acts that you know could potentially uh, bring about uh, the, the, the conception of, of, of children. Uh, he, he said that those acts clearly had uh, moral justification because, well, among other things, the human race has to survive. Sure. Um, but he says outside of that, um, 
there there needs to be a, a justification and it has to be more than it's fun or that it's something we consented to or it seemed like a good idea at the time or I was really drunk. <laughs> um, uh, so, so he sort of basically his central move is to try to establish a very high um, criteria for justification and as, as a result he um, ends up with very few uh, sexual relationships and acts being obviously uh, justified. Right. Now note that's kind of the exact opposite of our mainstream culture's attitude. Our mainstream culture's attitude is between consenting adults it's good. Right. Unless there's some really weird quirky thing that um, that uh, you know unless you've got uh, uh, a marriage that it violates or uh, you know you're you don't have full consent somehow or the consent's compromised but uh, but generally the secular culture says the default answer is things are justified uh, Proust says well why in the world think that the, you know the sex is a very serious matter which can be very harmful it can cause it, it can be very good it can cause the the, the creation of new life um, but at the very least, it's a very serious matter, and very serious matters, the, the, the default moral uh, response shouldn't be, it's automatically approved. Uh, rather, the, the default answer automatically needs a justification. Right. So now let me just pause and say, uh, I apologize for having mispronounced both Professor Bruce's name and Professor Beatty's name. And now you've got me nervous that I should be pronouncing your last name like Silvermane or something like that. But I think I got Silverman right. So maybe you, you could, have Silverman right. Okay. So maybe you could tell me what, uh, what Eric Silverman had to say in his contribution about what a general, you know, secular vision of, of chastity might look like. Good, good. Um, well, I talked about three traditional uh, kinds of virtuous principles that are all relevant to the virtue of chastity. Um, so Aristotle says that some instances of adultery seem to be offenses against justice, while others seem to be offenses against sort of both temperance and justice. Hmm. Um, and his point is something like this. Um, in some instances, it seems to be a lack of self-control full on, and the person uh, involved might have w preferred to, to control themselves uh, and, and not commit the injustice uh, by being involved with somebody else's spouse, uh, being involved in that spouse violating a, uh, a promise. Um, other times, it just seems like the person might have controlled themselves, they don't lack self-control, but they just didn't care. <laughs> You know, they were just sort of uh, flagrantly un unjust, unjust, and, you know, issues of justice weren't, um, weren't an issue to them. So um, from that, I, I thought and uh, developed the idea that um, being chaste involves temperance, a kind of self-control, uh, but it also involves justice, a kind of regard for uh, respect for others and the rights of others, the well-being of others. Um, and the others doesn't just involve our potential sexual partner, it involves anyone they've made a promise to, it involves anyone whose uh, well-being depends on the well-being of this person, it depends on, say, any children that they have, it, uh, uh, justice is relevant to, uh, there are just demands of justice for uh, any potential children that are, are created from a sexual relationship. So, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of uh, potential issues uh, regarding justice that, that uh, pertain to uh, appropriate sexuality. Um, temperance as well. Um, look, just because you're married, even, even if you're married to someone, that doesn't mean um, you get to do whatever you want when you, whenever you want, uh, and certainly not with whom you ever, whoever you want. Um, you know, the, there is still a need for self-control and temperance and communication and cultivation of a relationship. And, um, and, and surely you need a lot of self-control if you're going to be serious about uh, trying to wait and be thoughtful about a, a, a long-term relationship. I mean, even if you don't think um, sexuality, sexuality has to be reserved for marriage, you still need to realize that sexual relationships are a serious thing and get, and you shouldn't get involved in them at random. I mean, that's how you get involved with a real psycho. 
<laughs> um, you know, you, you, you need to have enough self-control at least to, you know, determine, you know, what partner, what potential partners are good choices and compatible at least, you know, longer term. Um, so I talked about the importance of uh, temperance, the importance of justice, and also the importance of what uh, uh, we virtue ethicists like to call uh, practical wisdom. Uh, you, you, you need wisdom. I mean, so um, so just because uh, you you have found a way to follow the rules, that doesn't mean that what you're suggesting is wise. So sure, you might have met somebody who you seem to get along with this weekend, and sure, you could go elope at the uh, the county clerk or the justice of the peace, or if you're in Vegas, the Elvis impersonator, um, and you could get you know legal married you know, morally okay sex, um, but that would be really foolish. Right. Um, in fact, uh, it, it is sometimes missed um, in the great Shakespeare love story, uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, they actually do get married off stage be before the, uh, the, the romantic scene on her balcony and bedroom. Um, but, uh, but this was an ill-advised relationship with a, with a high body count. Indeed. Indeed. So much for star-crossed lovers. Um, well, okay, so you we've talked about your contribution and Professor Prusa's and Professor Beatty's, all of the three of you offering some kind of chastity as a virtue that the secular culture should be able to embrace. But there's a fourth contributor in this first part of your book that seems to take a bit of a different tack. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to say hurt, but now I'm okay. All right. I was beginning to worry if I, boy, we're going to get to one, one author whose last name I'm sure I'm going to butcher here pretty soon. But anyway, um, Jennifer Hurt, whose chapter I think is actually the very first chapter in your book, she actually isn't willing to defend chastity as a virtue, and, and, and she actually thinks that it is incapable of being redeemed as such. So why is that, and what does she offer in place of uh, a secular sexual virtue? Good, good. Uh, well, uh, Professor Hurt, who, who, by the way, is excellent. Uh, we were very uh, thrilled to have her as part of our conference. Um, she talks about the importance of sexual temperance and sexual friendship, um, but the problem she has with chastity um, is, is largely a, a historical one, where she she sees it associated with some really negative attitudes about sexuality itself. Hmm. Um, so um, so it's uh, and it's true that that at least in places at, in times, um, people advocating chastity. Uh, both Christians and non-Christians have have really been uh, just pretty anti-sex, hmm. um, and she doesn't doesn't think that's appropriate. She thinks uh, sexual desire is a, a healthy part of being human, um, but she still offers a, a vision of long-term committed sexual temperance, um, and, and again, saying what we've heard through several of the lenses of the book so far that sexuality is a serious thing. You shouldn't embark on a, a sexual relationship, uh, you know, uh, recklessly, um, and it should be at least a longer-term thing. Now she stops short of saying that uh, you need a, a, a legal marriage. Uh, she she is open to the idea that you can, over a lifetime, have uh, you know a couple of of long-term. Uh, worthwhile, committed, healthy sexual relationships. So that's one of the ways that she's less conservative than the other uh, other visions that we've discussed. Right. Well, let's get even less conservative, arguably. Um, in a later part of the book, you've got a contribution by Alvin Goldman, who arguably is even more radical than Hurt, because Goldman evidently denies any moral restrictions on sexual activity specifically, although he does seem to think that there is a broader virtue that may have some applicability in the area of sexuality. So explain that for us. Sure. Well, Alan Goldman, uh, Professor Goldman is, again, we were really uh, lucky to have him as part of this project. Um, he's a, a very influential professor in philosophy of uh, sex and love. Um, he, he basically argues that, you know, surely there, there's some things that are morally relevant towards sex, but there's nothing specifically about 
there's no virtue specifically about sex. So there's some things about temperance. Of course, you don't want to be a sex addict. Uh, there's some things about truth telling. Obviously, you don't want to break promises and lie to people about uh, par, uh, uh, you know, as part of uh, uh, your, your sexual relationships. Uh, but outside of that and, and just getting genuine consent, um, you know, he didn't seem to think that there were a, a lot of uh, restrictions on on uh, on sex and sexuality. Hmm. And he's written uh, on this from various uh, angles before and has been uh, uh, pretty influential in the in the discipline. So I, I might have missed the, the answer there, but what is the broader virtue that he sees being applicable to sexuality? It's just not about sex specifically. I mean, again, a little bit about temperance, a little okay. bit about honesty, uh, a little bit about, uh, I guess, justice uh, with consent. Uh, but uh, again, a lot of these things were just sort of, uh, the connection was a little weaker there. Right, right. Uh, and, and, I, and I think he would say it that way. Gotcha. Now, um, this is uh, not about your book specifically, but I do want to give you a chance, since your book is an edited collection and not some sort of a dialogue book, uh, you know, of course, having responses to your contributions wouldn't be appropriate in an edited collection like this. However, given that you're one of the few authors who did present uh, in that first part of the book chastity as a virtue that the secular world ought to consider embracing, I suspect that you probably have some thoughts in response response to both Hurt and especially Goldman's contributions. And if that's the case, do, would you mind sharing what those responses might be? Where do you think that perhaps Hurt and Goldman might fall a little bit short in, the, in what they argue? Uh, well, obviously, uh, I have uh, more in common with uh, Professor Hurt than, uh, than Goldman. Sure. Um, uh, but uh, I think the, the main point that I would um, uh, try to press Goldman on is the question of uh, how much do we think sexuality affects our well-being? Because hmm. uh, it seems to me that uh, it just seems to me that that short-term sexual relationships are just sort of self-evidently, uh, you know, not that great for our our, our well-being. It seems that it, it exposes us to risk of uh, of infections. It, it exposes it makes us vulnerable and gets us deeply involved with. Uh, people that we may not have adequately interviewed. Um, it, it involves us with the, 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 the danger of uh, creating life with someone we're not prepared to uh, raise a child with. Um, and, uh, and I also wonder whether there is a sense of self and, and, and self wholeness that we threaten if we divide ourselves sexually between too many partners. Hmm. I, I wonder if there's a uh, a danger to our own psyche. Um, now, uh, again, uh, th there certainly are some risks there that uh, I could definitely back up and verify. Others are a little more speculative there, but I think that's the, the point I would press him on the most. Um, now, uh, Professor Hurt, I think, I think I agree with a lot that Professor Hurt said. I, I do think that the, that there are thinkers, I mean, look, I like, I like St. Augustine, but when I read his attitude about sexuality, uh, sometimes I just think, look, man, this is a guy that has sexual addiction before his conversion, and he went too far to the other direction after his conversion. Um, and uh, and so I, I find myself agreeing with Professor Hurt that uh, uh, sexual desire is, is part of human nature, and um, and having a a fully stoic attitude towards it and trying to fully be repressive towards it, that that doesn't sound very healthy. I, I, I agree with her on that. Um, now, I think the angle that neither of us talked a lot about in the book, and really Beatty might be the right person to appeal to, is the idea of family and children. Hmm. Because um, it seems to me that I might be able if it's just me and I'm never going to have any kids, I might be able to have a relationship with a person for 10 or 20 years um, and then have that end and have a second one afterwards and not have that be too devastating to my personal well-being. But once you get children involved in it, I think it gets a lot more complicated. Hmm. So I think a lot of it uh, has to do with 
um, our obligations to our kids. So, uh, so I, I think there might be a, a piece from Beatty's argument that that could be helpful to to press her more towards uh, a more uh, conservative view. Um, but, uh, but yeah. So, so I, I found that uh, all all five of the all four of those interlocutors are are really um, you know intelligent people that uh, I, I love learning from. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm enjoying reading it as well. Um, I, I guess the one question that still lingers in my mind, having asked you now to comment on uh, Professor Hurt's contribution, is that uh, you know she seems to think that virtue, uh, chastity as a virtue, isn't redeemable as such, precisely because of what you said a moment ago that it's become associated with prudishness, right? Uh, extreme, unhealthy kind of repressiveness. And so I guess the question I'd have for you before we talk about a few more chapters in your book is how can we commend, redeem and commend chastity as a virtue while at the same time um, pushing back on some of the baggage historically having to do with repressiveness and prudishness and stuff like that? Is it even possible? Could, could hurt me right? Maybe we can't redeem it and we've just got to let it go and go with what she proposes instead. Well, I'll say this. I don't get hung up on specific words mm. all that much. My commitment to the word chastity is is pretty minimal. <laughs> um, uh, so if you want to come up with some other word that is still, uh, you know, very self-control oriented towards one's sexuality and, uh, you know, taking into account all the other, uh, you know, considerations I've mentioned, I I'm open to using a different word. Um, surely there are some contemporaries uh, to whom that word has a lot of baggage. So, uh, so I I'm not... Uh, obsessed with keeping that particular word. So if you want to call it uh, thoroughgoing sexual temperance, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I can live with that. Um, but, um, but so, yeah, so I, I how can we advocate uh, a healthy attitude toward sexuality without giving full into indulgence? Uh, you know, Chris, I think that's the question with uh, most areas of life. Mm. And I'll, I'll appeal to that traditional Aristotelian idea of, of the golden mean, that um, you, you want the, the, the right median uh, disposition. You want, you, know, you, need, you want to acknowledge that uh, it's possible to have too much or too little. Um, and, uh, and, and I do think that that repressive uh, attitude is very unattractive uh, where, where you see it. Yeah. That being said, if uh, you you encounter an older couple who have had a successful relationship and have had children and and are still you know in love with each other um and frankly in love past the power of that initial sexual spark um so so here's you know that, that's really attractive and I, I think that something that gets lost about sexuality is this the best thing about sex uh, isn't just the intensity of the the, the act; it's the, the the closeness and ongoing intimacy with who, the person with whom you're 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 doing this. Right. Um, and and if if you accept that claim that uh, sexual relationships are more important than sex. Um, then I think there there is an argument that can be made that having this sort of long term uh, relationship with a history, even if you don't have the intensity of that initial um, you know euphoric uh, head over heels experience, uh, in some sense that might be better. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting thoughts. Well, let's turn to the rear end of your book uh, for a few questions before starting to wrap up. That came out a little bit the wrong way, but you get what I mean. Um, I understand. So this the topic of sexual objectification is going to be extremely relevant to today's culture, given how obsessed it seems our culture is with sex, with with pornography. And in his chapter on the topic of sexual objectification, Dustin Crummett, uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, offers some reasons for thinking that uh, that sexual objectification is morally wrong, um, and and he wants to he wants to give readers reasons for thinking that it's wrong and, and unhealthy, and you know. So so can you talk about some of the reasons why Crummit argues that sexual objectification is wrong, and, and what does he see as the virtue, the value of the virtue of chastity in sort of tempering that risk of, of objectifying a sex, sexual partner, something along those lines? Well, there's a lot in, in that chapter that talks about uh, sort of the symbolic value or, or what is signified by our willingness to objectify or, or choose not to objectify uh, the people around us. Uh, and one of the important things uh, is uh, to, to acknowledge that, look, if you're going to reserve uh, sex for long-term or lifelong marriage, um, that is a, a huge sacrifice. But there is a something that is signified by that sacrifice that's really valuable. And that signifies a, a very large level of commitment. Hmm. Um, so here, let me say it differently. If you want to marry someone you can trust not to cheat on you, marry someone who waited until marriage to have sex with you. Um, and then, you know, that gives you a, a layer of trust and a basis for trust that um, that might not be there if they've uh, been willing to have a dozen partners before you. Hmm. Um, so there's a symbolic value of that. It signifies something um, that uh, uh, might be easily missed. Now, I have to confess, Crummett's chapter is, in some ways, uh, I, I consider it the, the most interesting chapter in the book, and I always fear that I'm oversimplifying it in some way. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, there might be some nuance that I, I've forgotten in his chapter specifically, but I, I thought it was really, uh, I really liked the, the, the core insight there. Well, and, and, and I'm curious, what would he say are the biggest problems with sexually object objectifying somebody or a whole sex of, of, of people. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's easy for us as Christians um, to identify that kind of thing as wrong um, because we have uh, scriptures that talk about how we ought to treat fellow bearers of the divine image who just happen to be of the opposite sex. But how, from a secular perspective, can, you know, if, it, 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 maybe I could put it this way, is sexual object objectification something that is mental and uh, and therefore may not affect the person you're objectifying or is it an act that that is morally wrong where where does Crummett identify sexual object objectification as wrong as unhealthy well there's a couple chapters that touch on sexual objectification and i'll, I'll respond with uh sort of the, the the main traditional argument that goes back to Immanuel kant on this hmm. uh, essentially um you're treating a person as if they're a thing Hmm. Uh, treating uh, something that ought to be treated as an end in itself as a, a mere means to my own uh, my own pleasure. Hmm. Uh, so even if the, the person is never aware of this themselves, uh, I, I've still wronged them. The person who objectifies them has still wronged them. Hmm. Uh, furthermore, once you've objectified someone, it becomes easier to mistreat them. It might come out in your attitude somewhere else. Um, it might, you know, even if the, if the person doesn't know that that's the, the, the core root of it, um, you, something might slip out that suggests that you're treating them as more than, uh, more than a human being, mm. or as you would say in the Christian language, more than a fully, more than somebody who's a fully worthy image bearer of Christ. Right. And this is, this is actually why I, I think um, even if it's unintentional, even if it's unconscious, I think this is why um, uh, it's uh, why, you know, racists and people that um, s slavers and things will will think about and talk about their victims as property or as objects because it makes it that much easier to treat them in, in terrible ways. You know, uh, when, when parents whose children have been kidnapped go on the news appealing, pleading with the kidnapper to try and um, return them, they'll, they're, to they're told to, you know, say their name and talk about who they are because when you see somebody as a person and not just as an object, it will affect, even if you don't realize how, it will affect how you treat them. Is this, are those the kinds of things you're getting at? Yes, yes. Uh, again, there's a risk of, of subtly uh, dehumanizing, 
you know, de depersonalizing someone who's who's a person. So, yeah. Um, so that that's the fear. That's the All fear. Right. Uh, and if you get in the habit of doing that to, to people in general, or to the opposite sex in general, or to the same sex in general, um, still, it's not it's not healthy. It's not respectful towards them, um, and it's it, it can cause real problems. Yeah. All right. Well, now we're going to talk about the contributor whose name I fear I'm about to butcher, but I'm going to give it a chance. What's that? Are you about to refer to Joseph Prudhomme's chapter? Yes, but that's how I was going to pronounce his last name. So I feel good. Oh, good. <laughs> so in, in Prudhomme's chapter, he argues that even from a secular perspective, despite how obsessed and how um, uh, how much we love our porn in today's culture. Nevertheless, he argues that pornography, even from a secular perspective, even as acknowledged by people that are doing work in the field uh, that are secularists, pornography is still clearly deeply destructive. Um, and he argues that it's a, a, a clear and present threat to personal flourishing. So what are some of the reasons that Prudhomme offers for concluding that pornography is as destructive as he argues? Well, a lot of it goes to the issue of addiction, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, again, is, uh, is an offense against temperance or uh, it undermines temperance. Uh, here, let, let's talk a little bit. We just talked about the importance of treating others as a human person. Um, one of the things that is distinct about persons is having freedom of the will. Mm -hmm. Now, what addictions do is they undermine freedom of the will. So interestingly, it's kind of I, I'd never thought of this connection before. Uh, but in a certain sense, getting yourself addicted um, undermines your own personhood, whereas uh, objectifying others uh, is a failure to respect their personhood. Hmm. Um, and the more and being addicted literally to anything, you know, undermines your freedom of the will, undermines your ability to choose as a person. Um, one of the things along the, these lines is the data suggests that a lot of people who use porn also do not claim that they do not like or love porn. Hmm. And that is a combination to be stuck using something on the one hand, but to feel unhappy about that use, that is one of the, a major indicator of addiction. Hmm. That your use of it is, is less than fully voluntary. Um, and in a certain sense, you'd rather not. Um, so, but, uh, but you, you, you can't, uh, get people out of this addiction until you, you have, uh, sort of social attitudes and structures from the individual to the broader community that said that, that encourages people, you know, don't, don't go down that path that that's not a healthy path. Yeah. Well, now, and I fully agree, but I also know there will be many people who, uh, regardless of whether or not they are, in fact, addicted to pornography, will deny that they're addicted to pornography. And so for such people, if they say, I'm not addicted, so what's the problem with me um, partaking in pornography? Does does Prudhomme um, speak anything to that issue? Are there additional reasons why it's uh, destructive beyond just merely its potential for being uh, becoming uh, something you're addicted to? Okay, good, good. So there is the addiction slash uh, temperance concern, uh, but there's also the objectification concern. I mean, this is uh, sort of a paradigm of, uh, of, of, of objectifying other people. Um, so there, there might be a justice issue underneath there or that same kind of concern that we referred to more abstractly about what's wrong with uh, objectifying people. Um, there's just some other practical things too. Um, if you watch too much pornography, it really can risk warping your view of all the components of sex. Hmm. It can risk uh, warping your view of your of sexual partners, making you think that the average sexual partner is supposed to look like some ideal that uh, you know ninety nine point nine percent of the populace doesn't look like. It might undermine your own self-image because it might make you think even subconsciously that you should be able to perform certain ways, certain acts, certain, you know, accomplishments. So it might make you uncomfortable with your own body or your own sexual prowess. And it probably also warps your view of, of the sex act. Hmm. Um, so, um, so one of the concerns that philosophers have raised all the way back to Plato is that art, and by art, I just mean any um, 
any depiction. I don't mean things that are great <laughs> art, True. but uh, uh, but things that are mediated. Let me use that. Media can distort our our, our visions of things, our, our our view of things. So if you think that the idea that that sec- if you watch enough pornography and it all takes place between uh, a man and a woman who are physically perfect, who are twenty, who are perfect tens, as they say, they have a perfect sexual encounter for X number of minutes. Um, and then you look at your own re- real life relationship, you will you might feel bad about every, po- every portion of that. You might say, well, my partner doesn't look like that partner. I don't look like the, the, the person that I identified with. And our life, which I used to think, our, our sex life, which I used to think was pretty good, <laughs> uh, I guess it didn't look anything like that. So my, I, I have to try new things. I need to try new drugs, new accoutrements. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I have to uh, innovate. Uh, I mean, it, it could make you unhappy with something that you would otherwise be happy with. Yeah. In fact, I, I've heard that um, people, men in particular, although I imagine I, actually, if I'm not mistaken, uh, pornography used among, uh, among women is now just as prevalent as among men. Um, so this, there could be an element of this in um, amongst women as well. But at least amongst male porn users, my understanding is many of them even struggle to achieve and maintain an erection with a, a real life woman um, because they've so inundated their minds with these unrealistic expectations and you know things in, in pornography so yeah I, it's it's a real important thing and I'm glad that you address it in your book um, we've only covered about half of the chapters in your book I do want to give you a chance though if you want to to say a word or two about some of the other things that viewers might be able to expect beyond what we've already talked about uh, if they get their hands on a copy of your book do you want to say is there anything else that you might say viewers can expect when they get their hands on a copy well I think you gave a although we only talked about uh, about half of the chapter specifically I think we got a good feel for uh, uh, sort of the range of arguments and viewpoints. Um, There's one chapter in there that uh, uh, focused on Confucian visions of chastity. And uh, one of the the reasons why it was important to include that chapter is just to make the point, it's not just religious, it's not just Christians that think chastity is important. It's not just Westerners in general that have thought that chastity is important. But, you know, this has been a worldwide cross-cultural thing. An awful lot of uh, cultures have thought that uh, that something very close to what we discussed as chastity is important. Hmm. So we've got a, an example of an Eastern conception of chastity. Um, we have a, another chapter that talks about uh, visions of uh, chastity that uh, might be uh, better for, for women, uh, sort of uh, address the, the, the question of uh, is uh, is certain is the attitude in chastity good or, or bad for women in particular? Um, there's a, a chapter about Plato's Republic uh, and uh, sort of a uh, conventional account of chastity in, from ancient Greece. Um, but uh, but really, one of my hopes for uh, for for the book is that uh, people who are in roles that that speak. Uh, to sexual ethics, whether it's uh, pastors, whether it's marriage counselors, uh, whether it's uh, men who mentor other men, uh, I would hope that they would take a look at some of the content of this book and just try to to take a look and, and ask, are there principles in here that other people around me would benefit from? Um, because I think it's good for pastors and counselors and mentors to be able to give practical secular reasons uh, for uh, for sexual mor- morality, yeah. uh, I think you know. Again, I've got three daughters. Um, the more uh, committed the that the people that they are around to uh, temperance uh, and chastity, the more I like it. <laughs> um, I mean, you know that that's that that that's a good thing. That protects people. That yeah. protects people we care about. Yeah. Um, so. Very good. So, uh, so yeah, I, I hope that uh, people will judge it to be a resource. I will say, right now there is a hardcover version of my book available and an ebook version available. I strongly recommend the ebook because it is priced at an affordable uh, price point, 
uh, 35 or $40. Uh, the hardback is currently priced for academic libraries. And unless you are very well off or really, really want a hardback copy, um, you, you won't want to pay the, the, the full price on that. Uh, rumor is in about a year we'll release a follow-up soft cover uh, book, uh, part, in part in the hopes that we'll get some uh, classroom use out of the book. Very good. Well, let's begin to wrap things up. Um, one of the things I like to do most interviews is give uh, my guests an opportunity to offer sort of a parting message uh, in the event that viewers have forgotten everything else that we've talked about over the past hour and 20 minutes. And um, and, and in this case, you know, if, if viewers, for whatever reason, don't end up going and getting a copy of your book, I still think that some of the things we've been talking about are worth um, them thinking about. And so if you could say something to viewers who may not be pastors, mentors, professors, and you know, just average people, both average Christians and average uh, non-Christians, um, and if they forget everything that we've been talking about for the past hour or so, what would you want them to be uh, thinking about as they turn off the recording and go about their days? Oh, good, good. Um, I, I would just say this. Look, we all know sex and sexuality is a serious thing. Um, and in some ways, it's too serious to just be indulgent with, with every whim that, yeah. that, that one has and that those around us have. And uh, we should try to be a little more reflective on long-term effects on ourselves, on the people around us, on our kids, on our partners, um, on, on uh, potential partners, uh, significant others, on the, their spouses. Um, you know, our, our culture for too long has had the attitude that uh, the, the default assumption is uh, a green light is indulgence. Uh, I'm going to at least say, um, you know, we ought to be a little more reflective about this and uh, try to treat people as people and not as uh, sexual objects or, or, or gratifiers of our sexual uh, desires. Um, and uh and and i'm not an a prude i'm not a stoic i i think uh sex is a great thing uh but i think our our culture has gone too far uh on on the the spectrum of uh encouraging indulgence and experimentation where where maybe we just need to be more careful and more reflective and uh and try to you know uh i mean whatever your worldview fewer more long term, fewer partners who are held for more long term is probably better for you, uh, whether uh, uh, whether that's within a marriage or not. Um, you know, taking this more seriously, not being a sex addict is good for you, and uh, and a lack of self control is not. Um, so uh, again, the more our culture values things like temperance, justice, respect for our partners, respect for uh, promises between other partners in general, respect towards children, um, you know, I think the better off we'll, we're all going to be. Very well said. Um, and lest anybody disbelieve you when you say you're not a prude, they can go check out your book on Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 were you a fan of that show or did you just happen to be familiar with it enough to be able to write a book about it? Oh, so, um, so yes. Yeah, so um, I was a fan of the books. Um, I uh, thought it was very, you know, the story was very well done. Um, I started to watch the show. I blushed a little bit too much and said, yeah, I don't need to see that much nudity. I didn't <laughs> notice that much nudity in the books. So I, 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 I turned away from the, uh, uh, the, the show for a while there. Um, but uh, but I, I knew the books well enough and I, I'd written one essay for somebody else's Game of Thrones book. Uh, analysis of Game of Thrones books, uh, and uh, and I was approached and, and by uh, by my co-editor Rob Rob Arp, and he said, "Hey, um, I've decided to do this book. I've decided I've been asked to to edit this uh, this book on Game of Thrones, and you know I, I'm really I've done a lot of these popular culture and philosophy books." Uh, but I, I'm not as good on the, the, the content. And I saw that you did this other essay on the content. And I, I remember I've met you before. And would you like to co-edit uh, a book on this? And I said, would I? <laughs> I? I said, well, first of all, there's, there's two principles here. First of all, when someone asks you to write a book with them, you say yes. 
Um, second of all, I, I'd always said I always liked those specific books mm. uh, and, and thought that that they were really rich. Um, so uh, so then I said, okay, well I guess I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna watch the the the, the whole uh, series and um, you know and, and uh, I think that there are some things in in those stories that are are, are fascinating and I, I think. I think that I want to be someone that knows what the culture's thinking, and I and I don't think you can do that if you hide from these culturally important phenomena. Yeah. Uh, now that being said, I, I will say I'm much more comfortable advocating the books than <laughs> I am, uh, the, the the show. Um, but uh, but uh, you know. Follow your own convictions on this matter. That's absolutely right. And in my case, I'm grateful to have a wife who holds me accountable. We watched it together. I, I just looked away, sometimes plugged my ears. She would tap me on the shoulders when it was safe to return my eyes to the screen. I think it worked out fine. But not everybody has the luxury of a wife, you know, that can hold them accountable. So, yeah, each each person should follow his or her own convictions. Um, speaking of your work on Game of Thrones and other work that you've done, where can viewers go to find you and your work online if they want to learn more? more about you and look into some of the other work you've done well um i mean my books are all available on barnesandnoble.com on amazon.com uh, at the publishers uh my uh, sexual ethics book is a rutledge book um so uh so you can just google eric silverman uh philosophy uh on those sites and my my five books should come up i do have a website which i do need to update uh with uh, with this book uh, with my, my sexual ethics book. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are some, some good places, uh, to look. Uh, I, I have five books. I have two on the virtue of love, uh, one showing how the virtue of agopic love is good for the loving person. Hmm. That's called the prudence of love. I have a book on the supremacy of love art showing how you can have a whole ethics system centered on agopic love. Uh, I have a book of essays, a, a edited collection from Oxford, uh, that is about uh, philosophical issues and the idea of heaven. So it's uh, some philosophical analysis of heaven. Um, and then there's the two books we just talked about, the sexual ethics book and the uh, Game of Thrones book. Well, I hope that viewers will check those out. And the last question I'll ask you is for, for viewers that are interested in learning more about uh, Christopher Newport University, where can they go online to, to find out about it? Uh, www.cnu.edu. Um, it is a... Uh, an excellent uh, public public liberal, liberal arts college. If you're in Virginia and you get in-state tuition, it's a, it's a really a, an attractive offer. Even if even if you're not in Virginia, we're getting a lot of out-of-state students because uh, again, our leadership program is excellent. Our business school is award-winning, uh, and I like to think the philosophy department does okay too. With you uh, on that team, I'm sure you your department does very well. Um, Eric, again, thank you so much for your time today, and, and thank you for your friendship. It, it really does warm my heart to be able to call you a friend, and, and I really appreciate the time that you've taken to do this interview with me. Um, and I'll definitely encourage viewers to get their hands on a copy of your book. Thank you, Chris. Keep in touch. I will do. All right, bye. All right, so um, I don't think it was the kind of interview that keeps a lot of your attention. Um, I don't think I ever had more than 10 viewers uh, live during that time, but that's okay. This isn't a topic that's going to interest everybody. But I do think it's a topic worth thinking about, and uh, I think that it's a book um, that is worth getting and reading so that you can communicate with the secular world on the topic of sexuality with a little bit more um, knowledge and thinking at your disposal than maybe you would have otherwise had. So do check out uh, Eric's book. Just go to Google and search for Eric J. Silverman, and you'll find it there in uh, one of his books. And his other books are, are good, too. So, so check it out. Um, that's, that doesn't look like there's any questions or interesting conversations in chat, so we'll cut, uh, we'll cut out here in just a second. But let me tell you what will happen next, uh, next episode of The Apologetics in two weeks. Um, I will be doing a live interview with my friend Dan Patterson, um, who recently 
um, left the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries um, before the whole thing erupted in you know recently, and he has started his own ministry called Questioning Christianity, um, which is also the title of a book that he's just published with a co-author. He Dan Patterson will be joining me live for an interview in two weeks uh, from today, and we will talk about his book, his ministry, and about how to discuss questioning Christianity with people who are questioning. So come back in two weeks' time for the next episode of The Apologetics. That'll be Monday, July 12th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. And, oh, dear Lord, I, I hope that uh, the heat will, the heat wave will have passed. Uh, maybe I'll be able to close that door behind me and you won't hear my air conditioner running like you've had to today. So, anyway, thanks for, so much for joining and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, bye bye. I've been your host, Chris Date, and thanks so much for watching The Apologetics, where we think together through what we believe, why we believe it, and not something else. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up, like icon, the subscribe button, and the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are streamed or uploaded. Either way, come back in two weeks for the next episode of The Apologetics, streaming live on YouTube every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until then, 